Hi, welcome to the History Talks. I'm your host, Will, and this is Sebastian. In this episode, we begin our series on communist revolutions in the 20th century. And we will begin by discussing the Bolshevik takeover of Russia. So, Sebastian, tell me, how did the Bolsheviks take power in Russia? Well, our story begins in... Um with the ascension of Tsar Nicholas II to the throne of Russia, 1896, I believe. Tsar Nicholas was very ill-prepared. His father died when Nicholas was uh, quite young, um, died from an assassination, as did Nicholas's grandfather. Um, so, and Nicholas himself remarked at his coronation that he did not feel like he was ready for the responsibility of rule. Mm. Still, he pledged to try his best for the good of Russia. Okay, and just to set some context here, what year was are we talking about now, or what, or what decade are we talking about? So, right at the close of the 19th century. Okay, so we're at the very end of the 1800s. Yes. Okay, and how old is Nicholas at this time? Uh, he's, like, early 20s, probably. Early 20s, okay. Alright. Yeah. So, Nicholas considers himself to be very inexperienced and not fit for the job. And, um, already Russia is having its own host of problems. During the, when the rest of Europe was industrializing, Russia remained agricultural. Um, part of this was because of the boyars, or nobility, who had, who had kept um, a strong control, strong control over the institution of serfdom, which in Russia, serfs were basically slaves. Um, though um, Tsar Alexander III managed to um, finally abolish serfdom, uh, it was... People in Russia were still li not living very good lives. Hmm. Like most people, their lives consisted of just spending all day on a farm that's not even yours and um, hoping you make enough to eat. Okay, right. So they were, they were working very hard for somebody else and not having much to show for it. Yeah. Okay. So the main concern for much of the Russian government is industrialization and to, for Russian glory, because both of those things Russia has been lacking in. I see. First is industrialization, because so far the only factories in Russia are ones owned and built by English entrepreneurs hmm. for uh, cheaper labor. So, um, Russia starts investing in making its own factories, and, you know, some people will come to the cities, and there's some uh, level of industrialization as... They, as you know, coming behind does come with the advantage of already having all the technology made for you. Mm. But people, it was such a sudden change because they had just taken all this technology at once that the workers' riots broke out instantly. Um, people were not much liking the industrial working conditions much more than the bad agricultural working conditions. So, it's from this scene that Russia sees a lot of unrest, especially um, advanced by a socialist newspaper coming from an exiled Russian who was exiled for um, treason, named Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Hmm. Okay. He lives in Switzerland, because, again, he was exiled, hmm. and he runs a... He's part of the this general communist or organization that's trying to get communism into Russia. Mm. He's published socialist newspapers. He's uh, recently recruited a Georgian man uh, who, whose name is Yoseb. Um, though he, um, though to protect his family, he's often gone by the code name Stalin, mm. which would later become more than a code name for him. I see. And what was his actual name? It was some Georgian word I don't mm. feel like pronouncing. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, 
He led a faction within this Communist Party called the Bolsheviks, or the Majority, mm. which stood in opposition to the Mensheviks, or the Minority. Mm. Ironically, the Mensheviks were technically in the majority of the party, but that's beside the point. Hmm. Well, what, what, let's talk about that. How did that happen? How did it happen that the majority group was called the minority and the minority group was called the majority? Is it is it that they had more power, maybe less votes, but more power or more influence? Is that why? Um, possibly, though I've been unable to find sources for exactly where these names came from. Okay. Fair enough. And also the Mensheviks predated the Bolsheviks mm, by a little bit. Okay, so. maybe, maybe that's why. Yeah. Um, the Mensheviks were led by a frenemy of Lenin's named Leon Trotsky. Mm, I see. And, you know, they had their disagreements. Lenin considered Trotsky to be way too idealistic. Mm. And um, Trotsky considered... Um, Lenin to be not idealistic enough, but mm. they were willing to work together for communism if they absolutely needed to. I see. So, um, one of Tsar Nicholas II's great, greater industrialization programs is the infamous Trans-Siberian Railway, mm -hmm. a giant railroad connecting Moscow to Vladivostok. Uh, that would connect both sides of the massive empire and also, maybe give Moscow some more warm water. Hmm. I don't know. So, however, this leads to a conflict called the Russo-Japanese War because part of because Russia wants to build its railroad through Manchuria, and hmm. Manchuria is kind of being invaded by Japan. Wow. Okay. Japan. Are we still in the late 1800s at this point? Or no, we we've moved, or just... We into the early 1900s. We've just gone to 1904. Okay. Okay, so 1904, Nicholas is czar. Mm -hmm. um, Stalin, Trotsky, and Lenin have risen as leaders. Mm -hmm. And the what are they calling themselves at this point? Are they calling themselves communist? Are they calling themselves? They're referring to they they call themselves communists. Okay, they call they refer to themselves as communist, and then they have they they each represent a faction within that that political movement, right? Yeah. So is Nicholas aware of what's going on with this movement? Um, and he's certainly aware, but it's. But the movement's based in Switzerland, and they're... So he doesn't view it as a threat at this time. Yeah. Okay. After all, they've been exiled. How are they going to get back into Russia? I see. So the Russo-Japanese War starts. Now, because Japan is an Asian country, a tiny one, Russia thinks that this is just going to be an easy victory, get the people on his side, uh, maybe lower the unrest mm. through that, and... Um, you know, maybe even win some territory for Russia. So he rejects a peace offer from Japan, which Japan was offering to just take Korea and then let Russia have whatever part of Manchuria they wanted. Mm. But Nicholas rejected this to get this war so that he could get the people on his side I and see. fight what was supposed to be an easy war. Mm. And I say supposed to be because Russia, like nearly every European power at that time, had severely underestimated Japan. Mm, I see. After all, they had viewed it as just a backwater country that had recently gotten some factories and stuff. I see. What threat could they pose? Mm. Well, it turns out they absolutely embarrassed Russia. Wow. And I cannot understate how embarrassing this was. Mm. This would be like if, say, this would be like if, say, I don't know, the U.S. invaded Guatemala. Or what if we um, sent our soldiers over to the eastern Mediterranean region and kept them there for 20 years and weren't able to ever accomplish our mission? Or it's more like, imagine if we sent it to some African country that mm. had basically no economy, just some guns, and they won. They mm. actually beat our forces back. Like and Japan was that was lagging that behind. At this or point. they thought it was. They thought it was. They had that perception that it would be like that, but then they got there and found out, mm, Maybe the Japanese are a little bit smarter than we thought. Yeah. So, 1905, riots are breaking out across Russia, mm. namely in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. Okay. 
Um, there's calls for... There's all sorts of factions. The, some okay, of the, so the, the war weakens Nicholas's... Um, it, we, it weakens his power, or it weakens morale in his power, because yeah. he sent resources over. He thought that this war would rally his country, and they would gain an important resource. They would gain this land, yeah. Manchuria, and it was going to be an easy victory and would build morale. Instead, they come back with a loss. People are upset over yeah. it. He's struggling to maintain power. Yes. You have communist revolutionaries in there. They're now back in Russia? They've left Switzerland? Not yet. Okay. There but but their followers. Is that who it is? Their followers are in Russia. The, yeah. Okay. And are they instigating people? Uh, not just them, but there's also some um, other parties that are calling for a constitutional monarchy. Mm. There's factions that are calling for the abolishment of the monarchy. There's pe factions calling for just some change, any change, really. Okay. And even though the war wrap, wraps up by June of 1915, these riots are still going on. Okay. So there's a lot of unrest at home. Yeah. Okay. Well, so what happens next? Well, eventually, um, Nicholas concedes to one of the factions, the constitutional monarchists. He okay. agrees to create a parliament called the Duma. Mm. And um, the Stuma will approve laws, write laws, um, do whatever, um, represent people. Okay. So... What powers does he retain as the Tsar? He has veto power? Yeah, kind of similar to what the president could do. Okay. So, this would weaken Tsar Nicholas's power, but... What, but by appeasing this group, he takes out a major portion of the rioters. I, I understand. So, um, things calm down for a while. Okay. The so the population, a large segment of the population, is happy with this arrangement. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the communists, uh, they didn't like the idea of the Duma in the first place. Mm. And, and um, that? Because they wanted power for themselves, they didn't want to share with anybody? Yeah. Also, okay. they considered it a form of compromise with the bourgeoisie. Oh, I see. And okay. some and some leftists considered just not voting for Duma candidates at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyways, in 1916, the first Duma is sworn in. And then, almost immediately, uh, Tsar Nicholas backtracks on all the promises of power he gave to the Duma, mm. and they basically just turn into an advisory body with no actual power. Oh, uh, I see. Mm. Uh, and this is part, thanks in part to uh, a Russian finance minister named St Peter Stiolpin. Mm. And Stiolpin has something of a bad rap among the uh, Russian populace. Not just because he um, basically revokes the power from the Duma, but he but he's going to take whatever measures he thinks he needs to make sure that no more revolution happens, no more riots, no more rebellion. Okay. So he does this through harsh punishment. Mm. Um, and Is that effective? He, or he makes his harsh punishment with industrialization, and mm. it it's at least temporarily effective, it, mm. because he and his pol his policies are so um, harsh that that a uh, slang for uh, a noose is a stolpin's necklace mm. in Russian. Okay, but um, it but people are but he. Some of his industrialization uh, things have actually improved Russia's economy. They're okay. not as much of a backwater as they were before he came in. Okay. So um, some people are happy because the economy is rising, and uh, and others are starting to become okay. This guy's kind of scary. Let's not revolt, especially when the economy is going up. I see. Okay. And then eventually, Stolpin is assassinated, mm. and the culprit is not found. Hmm. Who would you suspect assassinated him? Or is it unknown? It's a mystery. Yeah, they covered the tracks. Okay. So, um, and the next guy basically just doesn't do anything. Hmm. He's, okay. So, and what year are we up to now? We're so we're... 20? Uh, we're 
finally getting to 1914. 1914, okay. 1914 <laughs> is when it all comes to a head, because mm. 1914 is when the Great War starts, World mm. War I. Ah, uh, okay. Despite e some efforts, even from Nicholas II, to uh, try to prevent the war, the war happens, and it's far bloodier than anyone could have predicted, mm. or far bloodier than they actually did predict. I see. And um, this creates uh, some more unrest in Russia, and it, you know... Um, it creates more unrest because... Russia has lost a lot of resources in this war. Is that they're right? losing they're resources? Losing they're losing spending money on it, and that's not all. But it's all. But there's also some scandals in the Russian court, mm. namely related to a guy called Grigory Rasputin. Mm, I see. Aside from uh, his name also being the name of a pretty cool song, um, mm. Rasputin was um, a wizard. It can only be described. Mm -hmm. He was he had a degree in theology, and um, the Tsarina of Russia, um, Alexandra, she liked him because he seemed to be able to use magic or whatever to heal her son. Uh. You see, her. You see, Nicholas and Alexandra. They only had one child, and he had. Uh, Hemophilia. Yeah, he had uh, hemophilia. He, his, his blood. You know, sometimes it just wouldn't clot. Okay, so, so Nicholas is distracted by Rasputin. Is that correct? Or, okay, he has a war. He has World War One going on. He has Rasputin in his in his palace or in his house. Yeah, he and, has a sickly son. Mm -hmm. And the unrest has not been fully squashed the unrest at home, is that correct? Yeah. He has communists that want to take over. Yeah. Okay. So what happens from there? So, um, with, so, um, Nicholas, in an effort to boost the war support, he, he does two things. He na he renames St. Petersburg to, to the more Russian-sounding Petrograd. Mm. I okay. don't think that did anything, but... Right. You know? Okay. And he decided to go help serve on the front lines with his troops. Obviously, okay. the, the king can't go in the trenches or anything, but he's gonna go to the... He went close. Yeah, he actually, he went to the actual front. He decided to not just stay in his palace all day, to actually go to the front. Okay, and did that increase morale when they saw their, their czar come out there with them? People thought it would, and it did among some of the troops. However, this... Because of Rasputin, this created a whole load of other problems, because... Mm, because Rasputin was left at home while Nicholas went out to the front, is that why? Yeah, so there were rumors of an affair between mm. Rasputin and Alexandra, though most historians say that there's little evidence for this actually happening. Mm. Um, a lot, there was this conspiracy that Rasputin was running the country, yeah actually, and um, that he had actually orchestrated all of Nicholas's things to start running the country or whatever. Mm. Um, so people tried to assassinate Rasputin, though the assassination, assassination plot was foiled by the fact that Rasputin just has an almost inhuman tolerance to poison. Mm. Like he drank a glass of wine that was poisoned and he didn't feel a thing. Okay, so let's get back to the, the communists. What were they doing at this point? Um, they had been... They had... Um, so they had just been continuing to do their thing mm -hmm. until 1916. Mm. This is where it gets interesting. Okay. Wilhelm II, the Kaiser of Germany, mm -hmm. and his staff see that there's unrest in Russia, okay. and they see an opportunity to basically throw fuel on the fire, which could ignite, ignite even more unrest, I which see. could lead to a weak enough Russian government that Russia would fold. I understand. So they send uh, Lenin and his fellow communists on train back to Russia. Okay. Lenin and his fellow communists, so Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin, are all in Switzerland at this time. Yeah, but... But the German government says, well, we have a use for you. We'll yeah. send you over to Russia... 
we know you're going to cause trouble over there. Yeah. And that's going to weaken Russia because we're fighting them. Yep. Okay. So they send them over in 1916, and what do they do when they get there? Well, Lenin immediately starts rallying people to his cause, um, pointing to all the Tsar's failures as reasons to start a revolution. Mm. And he's not the only one rallying people to his cause. There's um, other factions. Um, and, and eventually, in 1917, the February Revolution happens. And what is that? Um, basically, all the factions, both the left-wing anti-Tsarists and the right-wing anti-Tsarists, mm -hmm. rise up. Um, Tsar Nicholas is forced to advocate. His family is kicked out of the Peterhof Palace. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Tsardom of Russia is disbanded and replaced with the Russian Republic. Okay. Now, the Russian Republic's organization is interesting, because it has two governments. The Petrograd Soviet and the Moscow Provisional Government. Okay. Now, in case you don't know, Soviet is an old Russian term for a council, like okay. a, a workers' council. Okay. So, these two governments, you know, they have their disagreements, but supposedly they're supposed to represent both sides of the spectrum and uh, mm, okay. run the country. Because you said they were, they were right-wing anti czarist and there were the left wing anti czarist So that's why you mean that's what you mean when you say there were two governments. One that was represented by each faction. Yes. Okay. So, or each wing, I should say. Yeah. There's gonna be factions within each wing. But it, there were two different governments and which government had more power or did they divide up Russia? Uh constitutionally speaking, the provisional government was in charge. And which one is that? Uh the the one in Moscow, the one run by the more, uh, right, the one less communist. Okay. Oh, they're less communist. They're right-leaning. Yeah. Anti-Tsarist. Yeah. Okay. The government, they're constitutionally speaking in charge of Russia. Okay. What do the communists get at this point? Um, they represent the workers, get to pass some social reforms, what, whatever. What's the type of government that they control at this point? Um, it's supposed to be this parliamentary-ish democracy where, mm. or republic, or whatever, where basically um, there's different Soviets or councils across the country and they come to meet in Petrograd to form the Petrograd Soviet. Okay. Which is led by Lenin. Okay. So, the provisional government wants to keep the war effort going. They think, okay, We've reformed the country, gotten rid of the Tsar, now it's time to strike, go on the offensive, attack the Germans. Mm. So they launch a, a... So they launch a major offensive against Germany, and it does not go well. Mm. And it goes so terribly, in fact, that, um, that a lot of people actually lose faith in the um, provisional government. Uh, I see. Because they, because they, they're keeping this war going. That which many people uh, participating in the revolution stopped the war. Um, I see the war was unpopular during Tsar Nicholas's time. Yeah. Now Tsar Nicholas is no longer power, so the provisional government has taken over, which is supposed to be an improvement, and they continue this unpopular war. And not only that, they're getting beaten. Yeah. Badly. Okay. So what are the communists doing at this point? They're just sitting on the sidelines? No. And this leads to the October Revolution. Okay. And this is the real turning point because... Mm. Um, We're in October of 2016, is that correct? Uh, yeah. 2016, okay. Or, yeah, I think that's where the Julian calendar was at. Okay, that's fine. What the point is... Um, they march on Moscow. Did I say 2016? Yeah. I, I, meant, I meant to say, I just said 2016, didn't I? We're in, we are, let me say that again. We are in October of 1916. Yeah. I mean, technically these are February and October in the Julian calendar. Mm. Um, in the Gregorian calendar it was 1917. I, oh, I didn't know the difference. Yeah, the Julian calendar I think is like off. 
Because like the it's off by a year, so it's in the fall of nineteen seventeen. Yeah. Okay. So I I'm, I mean the Julian calendar is the one where November is actually the ninth month of the year. Okay. Um. So. So the Soviets they um they march on Moscow and overthrow the provisional government. Mm -hmm. This is called the October Revolution. Mm -hmm. And, and it, is there much resistance to that, or are they able to do that easily? Um, the provisional government just flees Wow! when the uh, Red, Red Army marches okay, in. Okay, the Red Army, so that is the communist army. So Lenin is leading an army that he's raised yeah. called the Red Army. And this... Where do they get their, their arms from? Um, I mean, they... Are they defectors from the Russian army? Um, it's people from the Russian army. Yeah. Um, it's... Um, you know, some of Russia's own manufacturing, because a lot of the workers are loyal to the Soviet. Mm. So, um, so, and plus the Soviet actually promises to make peace with Germany. Okay. So they march on Moscow, and this ignites the Russian Civil War. Mm. And, um, so the Reds' first move is to do as they promise and make peace with Germany. Okay. So they sign the Brest, no, sorry, yeah, the Brest Livotsk Treaty. Okay. Which gives um, and Lenin is is running this group at this time. Is that correct? Yes. He's number one there. Okay. Also, the Mensheviks have basically disbanded, and Trotsky has joined the Bolsheviks. Okay. So the so it's not only okay. So Lenin is the head of the Bolsheviks at this point. Yes. It's not Stalin. It's not Trotsky. It is Lenin. And they ideolo ideologically identify as Bolsheviks. Yes. When they go in and take over the provisional government. Yes. Okay. So, so they sign the brest livets Treaty, which get which grants independence to Finland, gives Germany the Baltic states, um, the Russian parts of Poland, and the territory of Bessarabia. Okay. Um, and in exchange, the Germans. Um, agree to at least not attack them for the rest of the duration of the Great War. Okay. So Germany is like, all right, I'm going to... So Germany turns their troops to the Western Front. Okay, so Germany is happy with this deal. They gain land, and they no longer have to fight an Eastern Front. Yeah, and they're, and plus uh, Germany think... Germany is thinking, okay, the communists, they're communists. They're going to collapse. We after the, after the Western Front is over, we can march back and... Um, make sure that the Tsar gets in back in power, or whatever right. we need okay. to do. Okay, they're thinking, the Tsar just got kicked out of power. They had a provisional government, which was not long-lived at all. Yeah. And then they they intentionally sent communists over there, just to cause problems. Yeah. The communists raised their army and marched. So they're thinking, there's no way these guys can, can run things for very long. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the Russian Civil War, um, it's bloody, and there's advantages on both sides. Okay, and who are the sides? The Red Army and the White Army. Okay, and, and who, who is the White Army? The White Army is is all the factions opposed to communists. Oh, okay, I see. So, and the Red, the White Army has more Russian territory at the start of the war, mm. but the Red Army controls all of them the most industrial parts. They control Moscow, Petrograd, Perm, and a bunch of other cities. And are they called the Red Army and the White Army? Does that represent the uniforms, the color of their uniforms? Uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, one, on the, one of the disadvantages the White Army has is that they are divided, because remember, it's everyone opposed to the communists. Mm. So there's all sorts of factions. Most of them are anti-monarchist Republicans, Okay. but there's also um, some monarchists, there's this guy called Baron von Ungern Sternberg, mm -hmm. who we could probably do a 15 minute episode on, but basically he was a monarchist who took over Mongolia and tried to help the White Army. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe we'll do a side episode, but let's stay, you know, let's stay focused on the communists here, or the, the Bolsheviks that are now running things in Moscow. Yes. So they implement a policy that's termed war communism, which is basically 
the so the pet, the Soviet owns all the factories, and the factories have to produce war stuff. Um, and they're fighting the whites. Um, so first, uh, Stalin is dispatched to to uh, take care of Ukraine. Uh, Stalin has some um, pretty good uh, marshals uh, loyal to him, and they quickly take care of the white loyal Ukraine, establishing the Ukrainian uh, SSR. Now, an SSR is a Soviet Socialist Republic, hmm. so part of this greater union that Lenin is forming. Because okay. as of right now, his c government is the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. Okay. Or the Rusvasar. Mm -hmm. And um, so now they're marching east. Um, the whites are marching west. Most of the fighting is happening alongside the Trans Siberian Railway. Mm -hmm. Now the whites make a few bull moves and get close to Moscow, which would be a strategic target. But then they overextend themselves, and the Reds are able to cut off their supply lines. And at that point, the Reds are, it's just a matter of um, the Reds marching through Siberia for the most part. Mm. Uh, the, after the end of World War I, uh, there are some attempts made by the Entente to support the White Army, namely through sending divisions through the Arctic Sea to launch a surprise attack. But this does not work well for the whites who, as the surprise attack is repelled. Hmm. And um, eventually the... And this war lasts a while and some other stuff happens. Namely, Trotsky tries to invade Poland. Because hmm. remember, Trotsky is the most idealistic out of the Red Party leadership. Okay. So he's like, alright, we're winning the war, let's let's invade the other countries and spread communism everywhere. Global revolution! Okay. Because global revolution was something Trotsky was extra big on. All right. And he invades Poland in 1919 in what's called the Polish-Soviet War, and it does not go well. And Ru Russia retreats in 1920, and they sign a peace deal. Hmm. So, this... So, so we're now up to 100 years ago. 20, or 1920. Yeah. 1920, okay. So the Soviets are fighting the war, and here's some interesting things. So this is the what was originally the civil war, the Russian civil war between the Red Army and the White Army. Yeah. At this point, the Red Army has won. Or they're they're on the track to winning, but they're they on the were, track to winning. But they yet, even though they haven't even won their own internal civil war, they're going out and gaining new territories. Or Trotsky is trying to. Trotsky is trying to, okay. But after his failed invasion of Poland, mm -hmm. um, and this and this is where I'm about to transition into some of the most important parts of the internal politics of the Bolsheviks. Okay. Because there's basically two candidates for who will inevitably need to succeed Lenin, uh, Lenin mm. Stalin and Trotsky. Okay. So is Lenin the oldest of them? Is that why? Is he an older generation? Uh, he's the oldest both in terms of age and membership of the Communist Party. Okay, but yeah, I'm talking specifically in age. When you say somebody is not going to need to succeed him, I'm assuming we're talking about a younger generation. Yeah. So Lenin is older, Trotsky and Stalin are the next generation, and it's between them who is going to be the leader of the party after yeah. Lenin. Okay. Now, Trotsky... Now, Lenin likes Trotsky more because he seen because you know he may be an idealist, but mm. he's a principled idealist, or I at see. least as as far as Lenin's concerned. So mm. uh, Trotsky seems like he might be a good fit, but the rest of the Bolshevik Party is starting to like Stalin more and more. Mm. Now part of this why is that? Now part of this is of course Trotsky's disastrous Polish campaign. I see, but it's also because uh, Stalin his. He's much more practical, much more pragmatic, mm -hmm. and um, he he focuses on things that other officers actually care about. He's okay. he's the one who's helping to drop the strategies. He's the one um, saying, "Okay, if we do this, um, then this will then it'll have this result, and we'll boost productivity or whatever." I understand. So it's essentially. 
realism is more popular than idealism mm -hmm. in this situation. Okay. So, and I think, you know, we've been going for a while here. We're going to do a whole series, but I think this would be a good point to wrap up because we've now discussed how we went from Nicholas gain, becoming Tsar, mm -hmm. losing his power, a provisional guy. We, we, we looked at the surrounding wars, for yeah. example, out in, in, in Asia, their war with Japan, and then World War II and war with Germany, and we looked at how the provisional government gained power, we looked at how then the Bolsheviks came and kicked out the provisional government, now they've gained power, they're fighting a civil war which they are winning, mm -hmm. and we know Lenin is in charge, and he, they're looking to Trotsky and Stalin, and I think that would be a good place to end this episode, we could start yeah. the next one with talking about who ends up taking control of the party next. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think that's a good place. And did you have any final things you wanted to say about our um, first episode on communist revolutions? Well, the Soviet national anthem is actually a really great song. <laughs> all right. Okay, well, thank you all for tuning in, and we will see you in our next episode on the communist revolutions of the 20th century.